Shalom family. There is an image that is thought of by many as a symbol of power, strength, and redemption. It is recognized as one of the most important symbols in Christianity. You can find it on Bibles and logos, on religious sites, church buildings, in their altars, hospitals, schools, tombstones, in the field, etc. People put them on their walls and throughout their houses. People wear them around their necks with pride and confidence. And when I say people, I'm not just talking about those who are believers, but non-believers alike. Many, again, not just believers, decorate themselves with tattoos of it. It seems that the cross is reverenced and worshiped in some way or form all over the world. A lot of people use the cross as a symbol of their faith. At first glance, it may seem like a good thing, but unfortunately, many have come to worship a pagan idol, which is exactly what the cross is. In this video, we're going to share with you what we have learned about the cross in hopes that you get understanding as the scripture commands and turn away from this profane pagan idol. We are also going to talk about what it was that the Messiah was impaled on, and it was not a cross. We are sure that some of you may know about this subject. We hope that you can use this tool to share with those who are in need of understanding to stay away from the idolization of this thing that believers should never have come to idolize. So please share this with all those you know, as this is vital for every believer to know. Also, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. The cross. Many people regard the cross as a strong symbol of Christianity, but it was originally a pagan symbol and idol and still is today. Long before Christianity was formed, the cross had been used as a symbol of pagan religions. The renewed covenant, also known as the New Testament to most, Written in the Apostolic Age, which is the period from the death of the Messiah until the death of the last of the Twelve Apostles, also said to be to the end of the first century, has no record of the cross as a symbol for the body of Mashiach. Nevertheless, how did the cross come to be firmly established in the church? To answer that question, we have to go way back into ancient times, but before we do that, Let's look at the origins of the word cross. The word cross comes probably from Old Norse or another Scandinavian source picked up by the Norse from Old Irish cross, from Latin crux, crucem, crucis, stake, cross, on which criminals were impaled or hanged, originally a tall round pole, hence figuratively torture Trouble, misery, crux, a cross, from Latin crux, cross, a word of uncertain origin. One of the entries for cross is crux that has an uncertain origin, and that is something to keep in mind. Here are a few references on the origin of the cross. Davis Dictionary of the Bible states this about the origin of the cross. The pre-Christian cross of one term or another was in use as a sacred symbol among the Chaldeans, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, and many other nations. According to the Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, the cross originated among the Babylonians of ancient Chaldea, the central territory of Babylon, and was as the symbol of the god T-A-M-M-U-Z. The true original form of the letter T, the initial of the name of T-A-M-M-U-Z, which in Hebrew, radically the same as ancient Chaldea, 
as found on coins, was formed as an illustration number one. And in Etrurian and Coptic as in number two and number three. That mystic towel was marked in baptism on the foreheads of those initiated in the mysteries by the pagan priests and was used in every variety of way as a most sacred symbol. That which is now called a Christian cross was no Christian emblem at all, but was a pagan sign of the mystic Tau of the Chaldeans and the Egyptians. The cross was a symbol of the Roman god M-I-T-H-R-A-S and the Greek A-T-T-I-S and their forerunner T-A-M-M-U-Z, the Sumerian sun god, habitually associated with I-S-H-T-A-R. According to Alexander Hislop, in agreement with Sir Archibald Edmundstone, a British writer, 1483, in Egypt, the earliest form of that which has since been called the cross was no other than the crux ansata, sign of life, borne by O-S-I-R-I-S, and all the Egyptian gods, that the ansa or handle was afterward dispensed with, gotten rid of, and that it became the simple towel or ordinary cross as it appears at this day, and that the design of its first employment on the sepulcher therefore could have no reference to the crucifixion of the Nazarene but was simply the result of the attachment to old and long-cherished pagan symbols. Continuing in making the point that the cross was a pagan symbol and its importance to the religion, we are going to focus on types and uses of crosses. In the pagan religions, the cross has had a special meaning, often signifying the balance between the physical and spiritual realms. It was used to represent religious beliefs, to ward off evil, and to symbolize luck and good fortune. Crosses can be found in Egyptian books, old monuments, and walls of ancient temples. A noted historian in reference to Egypt quotes, here, unchanged for thousands of years, we find amongst her most sacred hieroglyphics, the cross in various forms. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, the sign of the cross represented in its simplest form by a crossing of two lines at right angles greatly predates in both the East and the West the introduction of Christianity. In China, it was the most ancient device. In India, it was a sacred symbol for centuries among non-believing people. It is an emblem of disembodied Jain saints or monks. In the central part of India, two crude crosses of stone have been discovered, which date back to a time centuries before the Christian era, one over 10 feet and the other over eight feet. In Palenque, Mexico, found by Voltan, the ruler king of Palenque, Mexico, in the ninth century before the Christian era, is a heathen temple known as the Temple of the Cross. The Catholic Encyclopedia includes a photograph of this cross, a central cross, six and a half by 11 feet on an altar slab, beneath which are the words, pre-Christian cross of Palenque. Ages ago in Italy, before the people knew anything of the arts of civilization, they believed in the cross as a religious symbol. It was regarded as a protector and was placed on tombs. The Vestal Virgins, the priestess of the hearth Roman goddess Vesta, of pagan Rome wore the cross suspended from their necklaces as the nuns of the Roman Catholic Church do now. The Greek depicted crosses on the headbands of their god corresponding to T-A-M-M-U-Z of the Babylonians. I-S-I-S -I -S was shown with a cross on her forehead. Her priests carried processional crosses in their worship to her. The cross was used as a religious symbol by the Aborigines of South America in ancient times. Newborns were placed under it for protection against evil spirits. It was tattooed to their foreheads. 
These are some types of ancient crosses. The Greek cross was found on Egyptian monuments. The Maltese cross was found on kings among the ruins of Nineveh. The Latin cross, known as the cross that most use today, or the quote-unquote Christian cross and most popular cross, was used by Etruscans, people of ancient Italy, as seen on an ancient pagan tomb with winged angels on each side of it. St. Andrew's cross appeared on the coins of Alexander Bala in Syria in 146 BC, long before St. Andrew was born. The Ankh is one of Egypt's oldest symbols. It represents life both on earth and in the afterlife, according to Egyptians. The Celtic cross, also known as Odin's cross, is a popular symbol that is associated with the Celtic culture. It is a cross with a circle in the center and often used as a symbol of faith and protection. The pagan cross was worshiped by the pagan Celts long before the birth and death of our Messiah. It was worshiped in Mexico for ages before the early church missionaries set foot there. Large stone crosses were erected, probably to the God of the rain, T-L-A-L-O-C, dates back to ancient Europe. The cross was also popularized by the Ku Klux Klan to represent quote unquote white pride. The swastika, crux gamata, constructed from four Greek letters, gammas, attached to a common base. It was significant in Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism. The Tao form, also known as the cross of St. Francis, looks close to the Greek letter T. The Tao cross represents both the Roman god M-I-T-H-R-A-S and the Greek god A-T-T-I-S. This symbol also influences astrology as the Taurus bull sign gets its name from the T-A-U. The Tau Cross, the idolatrous standard of the early pagan nations, and its image was consecrated to religious uses among the nations of Europe and Asia long before the Christian era, and also in America before Columbus. The cross was used in orgies of the ancient heathens. It was used as an amulet, charm of protection, over the heart. There is hardly a pagan tribe where the cross has not been found. The cross, as we have learned so far, is a pagan symbol and idol used in many ways before the birth, death, and ascension of our Messiah. So, one has to wonder, how did this idol become a vital part of the life of Christians or believers? One way to answer that is to look no further than Rome during the reign of Constantine I, also known as Constantine the Great, and it all began with a quote-unquote vision. The 1934 Encyclopedia Britannica states, In every part of the world, crosses were used both as religious symbols or as ornaments long before the Christian era. It did not become the symbol of Christianity until 400 years later, during the time of Constantine. The following information will be taken from the book, The Two Babylons, written by Alexander Hislop. We will read some key points. Joseph Milner, author of The History of the Church, gives the following account. Constantine, marching from France into Italy against Maxentius in an expedition which was likely either to exalt or to ruin him, was oppressed with anxiety. Some god he thought needful to protect him. The god of the Christians he was most inclined to respect, but he wanted some satisfactory proof of his real existence and power, and he neither understood the means of acquiring this, nor could he be content with the atheistic indifference in which so many generals and heroes since his time has acquiesced. He prayed, he implored with such vehemence and importunity, and God left him not unanswered. While he was marching with his forces in the afternoon, the trophy of the cross appeared very luminous in the heavens, brighter than the sun, 
with this inscription, conquer by this. He and his soldiers were astonished at the sight, but he continued pondering on the event till night. And Christ appeared to him when asleep with the same sign of the cross and directed him to make use of the symbol as his military ensign. According to Hislop, there are some contradictions to the story of Constantine's vision. The testimony of Lactantius, who was the tutor of Constantine's son Crispus, the earliest author who gives any account of the matter, and the indisputable evidence of the standards of Constantine themselves as handed down to us on medals struck at the time. The testimony of Lactantius is most decisive. Constantine was warned in a dream to make the celestial sign of God upon his soldiers' shields, and so to join battle. He did as he was bid, and with the transverse letter X circumflecting the head of it, he marks Christ on their shields. Equipped with this sign, his army takes the sword. Now, the letter X was just the initial of the name of Christ, being equivalent in Greek to CH. If, therefore, Constantine did as he was bid when he made the quote-unquote celestial sign of God in the form of the quote-unquote letter X, it was that letter X as the symbol of quote-unquote Christ and not the sign of the cross, which he saw in the heavens. In plain terms, the cross that was used today is not the cross that is used by Constantine, but look like this. The cross of Constantine that was supposedly the quote-unquote Christian cross was not a T cross at all, but the letter X, which was used to represent the name of Christ in Constantine's time. Hislop continues to show that the X and not the cross was regarded as the quote-unquote heavenly sign. The words at the head of the inscription are these, In hoc vences, in this thou shalt overcome X. Nothing whatever but the X is here given as the victorious sign. If therefore that crossbar was the quote unquote celestial sign, it needed no voice from heaven to direct Constantine to make it, nor would the making or displaying of it have excited any particular attention on the part of those who saw it. We find no evidence at all that the famous legend in this overcome has any reference to the crossbar, but we find evidence the most decisive that the legend does refer to the X. Now that X was not intended as the sign of the cross, but as the initial of Christ's name is manifest from this, that the Greek P equivalent to our R is inserted in the middle of it, making by their union C-H-R. The standard of Constantine then was just the name of Christ. Whether the device came from earth or from heaven, whether it was suggested by human wisdom or divine, supposing that Constantine was sincere in his Christian profession, nothing more was implied in it than a literal embodiment of the sentiment of the psalmist. In the name of the L-O-R-D, will we display our banners. Hislop writes, his good faith, however, has been questioned, and I am not without my suspicions that the X may have been intended to have one meaning to the Christians and another to the pagans. It is certain that the X was the symbol of the god H-A-M in Egypt and as such was exhibited on the breast of his image. Whichever view be taken, however, of Constantine's sincerity, the supposed divine warrant for reverencing the sign of the cross entirely falls to the ground. In regard to the X, there is no doubt that by the Christians who knew nothing of secret plots or devices, it was generally taken as Lactantius declares as equivalent to the name of Christ. In this view, therefore, it had no very great attraction for the pagans who even in worshiping H-O-R-U-S had always been accustomed to make use of the mystic towel or cross as a sign of life 
or the magical charm that secured all that was good and warded off everything that was evil. When, therefore, multitudes of the pagans on the conversion of Constantine flocked into the church, like the semi-pagans of Egypt, they brought along with them their predilection for the old symbol. The consequence was that in no great length of time as apostasy proceeded, the X, which in itself was not an unnatural symbol of Christ, the true Messiah, and which had once been regarded as such, was allowed to go entirely into disuse, and the Tau, the sign of the cross, the indisputable sign of T-A-M-M-U-Z, the false Messiah, was everywhere substituted in its stead. Now this pagan symbol seems to first have crept into the Christian church in Egypt and generally into Africa. A statement of Tertullian, early Christian author from 160 AD to 240 AD, about the middle of the third century, shows how much by that time the church of Carthage was infected with the old leaven. Egypt especially, which was never thoroughly evangelized, appears to have taken the lead in bringing in this pagan symbol. The first form of that which is called the Christian cross, found on Christian monuments there, is the unequivocal pagan Tau, or Egyptian, sign of life. Another reason that the Tau cross was given life is believed to be because of the writings of the Epistle of Barnabas and the Gospel of Nicodemus. These writings are both under scrutiny because they are believed to be false writings. Nevertheless, these writings are believed to be embedded in the history of the church. It was Barnabas that influenced the church through the epistle supposedly written by him that claims the kingdom of our Messiah is attributed to the cross. His influence helped to magnify the power and give the glory to the sign and figure of the cross, which has been passed down through church history without challenge because of the respect of his name. Nicodemus, in his supposed letters, glorifies and honors the cross, calling one to live by the cross. Henry Dana Ward, author of The History of the Cross, The Pagan Origin, and Idolatrous Adaption and Worship of the Image, summarizes the cross glorification of the Gospel of Nicodemus in this way. Counterfeit and worthless in itself, as this blasphemy is, it shows the original sources whence comes the glory of the sign of the cross among Christians to be followed in due time by the reverence and worship of the image. In the early ages, many half converts readily received these wonders in the names of the apostles and mingled them with the fables of their own superstition. Thus the wonder grew until all Christendom has bowed to the power of the sign and image of the cross, and the reverence and love of the image in America grows every hour, even among the zealous in our evangelical connections. As we have mentioned before, the early church Roman Catholic leaders accepted pagan idols and symbols in the name of evangelizing more pagans, and the cross was one of these things. Where they thought the cross to be a reminder of the crucifixion of J-E-S-U-S, -S, they saw that the pagan converts regarded the cross image as sacred, so they brought the cross into the church for them to worship. We have shown through research and credible sources that the cross was a pagan symbol of worship. It was accepted into Christendom by the early church leaders, the Roman Catholics, starting as early as the second century with such references from the Epistle of Barnabas and other writings, and with the legalization of Christianity by Constantine in the early fourth century. What we are saying through this is, ultimately, the pagan idol, the cross, be it Latin or Tau, should never have been part of the believer's life, and also the word cross itself was a replacement for what the Messiah was really hung on. We're going to reveal the research on this starting with scripture. Matthew 27, 42. He saved others, himself he cannot save. 
If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. John 19, 25. Now there stood by the cross of J-E-S-U-S, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. The word that cross replaced in these scriptures is referenced under Strong's G4716. That word is staros, and its meaning is a stake or post. To get further understanding of the word staros, we turn to the New Strong's Concise Concordance and Vine's Concise Dictionary of the Bible. Here is how the entry reads. Staros denotes primarily an upright pail or stake on such malefactors were nailed for execution. Both the noun and the verb staru to fasten to a stake or pail are originally to be distinguished from the ecclesiastical form of a two-beam cross. The shape of the latter had its origin in ancient Chaldea and was used as a symbol of the god T-A-M-M-U-Z, being in the shape of the mystic Tau, the initial of his name, in that country and in adjacent lands, including Egypt. By the middle of the third century AD, the churches had either departed from or have travestied certain doctrines of the Christian faith. In order to increase the prestige of the apostate ecclesiastical system, pagans were received into churches apart from regeneration by faith, were permitted largely to retain their pagan signs and symbols. Hence, the Tau or T, in its most frequent form, with the cross piece lowered, was adopted to stand for the cross of Christ. This is a viable Bible resource, and they make it very clear that Yahusha Hamashiach, the one the world wants to call J-E-S-U-S, was not impaled on a T-cross. Our Messiah, the one whom the Father Yahuwah sent to die for our sins, to atone for our wrongs, to reconcile us back into his family, was impaled on a stake, not a wicked pagan cross. Some believe it was simply a torture stake with no cross piece whatsoever. The word cross automatically conveys the meaning that two pieces of wood cross each other at some point or angle. The Greek word from which cross is translated in the New Testament, storos, means an upright stake or post. This clearly shows the foolishness of many types of crosses being quote unquote Christianized or being in the life of a believer. There's another reference in scripture that tells what our Messiah was impaled on. Acts 10.39, Acts 13.29, Galatians 3.13, 1 Peter 2.24. These scriptures speak of Messiah hanged on a tree. If you look into the meaning of this word, it is referenced under Strong's G3586 Zulan, meaning a timber a stick, club, or tree, or other wooden article of substance. Staff, stocks, tree, wood. There is no misunderstanding this. Our Messiah was either hanged on a tree or stake, not a cross. We don't know why it was changed in the Bible, but we do know that the Most High never wanted for it to be worshiped, honored, adored, exalted or reverenced, whether you call it a cross, which it was not, tree or a stake. Alexander Hislop basically expresses his opinion of the cross and we tend to agree. The cross could have no reference to the crucifixion of the Nazarene, but was simply the result of the attachment to old and long cherished pagan symbols, which is always strong in those who with the adoption of the Christian name and profession, are still, to a large extent, pagan in heart and feeling. This, and this only, is the origin of the worship of the cross. If the original piece of wood that Messiah died on was still in existence today, 
there would be no reason to set it up as an object of worship or esteem. The early believers in the Bible did not consider it as a virtuous symbol, but rather as the accursed tree, a device of death and shame. The stake served its purpose, and that was that. Hebrews 12.2 Looking to the princely leader and perfecter of our belief, Yahushua, who for the joy that was put before him endured the stake, having despised the shame, and sat at the right hand of the throne of Yahuwah. There is no instance of exalting or of honoring the visible form of the cross or the stake in the renewed covenant. It is an emblem of humiliation and sorrow. The stake was inflicted on hardened criminals and enemies, those who revolted and rebelled during that time. There was nothing good about the stake in and of itself. The cross is yet one more symbol of the Romish worship to be noticed. In the papal system, as is well known, the sign of the cross and the image of the cross are all in all. No prayer can be said, no worship engaged in, no step almost can be taken without the frequent use of the sign of the cross. The cross is looked upon as the grand charm, great refuge in every season of danger, in every hour of temptation as the infallible preservative from all the powers of darkness. The cross is adored with all the homage due only to the Most High, and for anyone to call it. The same sign of the cross that Rome now worships was used in the Babylonian mysteries, was applied by paganism to the same magic purposes, was honored with the same honors. We shouldn't have to say this at this point, but feel that we have to. The stake, and definitely the cross, should not be esteemed or honored, and here are some reasons why. The cross is a graven image. Worshiping the cross, or stakes for that matter, is idolatry. Crosses have nothing to do with our belief. Rather, it was and is an idol that was introduced while churches were being secularized and paganized. Yahuwah warns his children in scripture against taking in or having graven images. Exodus 24 through 6. You shall not make for yourself any idol or any likeness, form, manifestation of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth as an object to worship. You shall not worship them nor serve them for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous and passioned El, demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine, visiting, avenging the iniquity, sin, guilt of the fathers on the children, that is, calling the children to account for their sins of their fathers, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing graciousness and steadfast loving kindness to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. The cross is a pagan symbol and we are not to take the profane and try to make it Kodesh or holy. The cross has no power. It does not provide protection. The cross doesn't mean mercy. It has no life in it, nor does it possess the ability to give life. Why would someone want to esteem something that was meant to end a life? If our Messiah was killed in a different time period, it may have been by stones, a gas chamber, a needle, a firing squad, a noose, or a guillotine, to name a few. So for those that wear a cross or have them in your home or office or tattooed on your body, would you then wear stones, needles, gas chambers, etc. around your neck or decorate with them? Why would anyone want to use a tool meant for death as a remembrance of our Redeemer? As we mentioned, this wood was a tool of shame, not of power, nor as something to be esteemed or worshipped. Yet, it is worshipped. Many Christian sites and in Christian and gospel songs, there is much praise and honor to this tool of death rather than to the one who gave his life upon it. 
All right, let's take a look at a couple of examples that we're referring to where Christian sites have uh, honor and esteem and worship to the cross. So this first example is from crossway.org. This article is titled 10 Things You Should Know About the Cross. Scroll through them really quick. The cross is a Trinitarian event. The cross is the center of the story of the scripture. The cross redefines power in the kingdom. The cross inaugurates the new covenant. The cross conquers sin and death. The cross vanquishes the devil. The cross is substitutionary. The cross is foolishness to the world. The cross brings peace, reconciliation, and unity. The cross is the marching order for Christians. Now, while it does list a lot of scripture underneath these things, if you notice the actual titles of these, it references the cross. And I want you to know the cross doesn't bring peace, reconciliation, unity, and so and et cetera of all these things that we've looked at and saw in this article. Let's look at something else real quick. It's from billygram.org. Uh, someone asked a question. It says, I'm puzzled why people wear crosses around their necks, but their lives reflect nothing of the L-O-R-D, J-E-S-U-S. I'm not going to look at this full article or read it, but I just want to point to this uh, last paragraph here. It says, G-O-D designed the cross to defeat S-A-T-A-N, the deceiver, and break his power, basically, at the cross. Now, it's ridiculous to say that the Most High designed the cross to defeat the enemy. That's, that's not true. That just happened to be the tool that was used to fulfill the plan and purpose that Yahuwah had for Yahushua, which happened to be on the stake. We're not to reverence it. We're not to honor it. We're not to give praise to it and so on. Let's look at something else. There's plenty of songs out here uh, talking or referencing the cross. Let's let's look here at the top. Here's the top 100 songs about the cross. I'll scroll through so you can look at that really quickly. I'm not going to stop and really pause on these, but just kind of scroll through so we can just look at some of the names of these things. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, we did find one that was interesting as we were looking through some of this earlier. And here's one called The Cross Has the Final Word. Now, let's look at some of the lyrics here. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Let me zoom in for you there. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night. The cross has the final word. And so on. Keeps repeating the cross has the final word and so on. It says, oh, thank you, Jay. And continues on. The cross has the final word. cross has the final word. The Savior has come with the morning light. The cross has the final word. And I'll scroll through so you can continue looking at this if you'd like. But the cross does not have the final word. And if it did have the final word, what is it saying? It's victorious. Is it saying you lost the one that was on the cross? Is it saying victory? Like what, what is it saying? What is the cross saying if it has the final word? And if it had the final word, then our Messiah didn't have victory. Because if the cross won, then what happened to our Messiah? It's ridiculous. I mean, to pe for people to write these songs and give honor and esteem to a cross, or even if you want to say the stake, which is really what it was. Why are, Why is anyone singing songs about the cross? The cross has no power, has no life, has no ability to give life. The cross doesn't do anything for a believer. Now, there's no difference with that versus even, it's the same with different black gospel songs. A lot of those other songs were a lot of contemporary Christian songs. But same with, you know, black gospel songs. We see a lot of these songs referencing and singing to the cross. And, and while many of them do represent or actually not represent, but to say the name of J-E-S-U-S -S in these songs, they're mixing his name with the cross, giving honor and esteem to the cross. Now, you already know we don't call the Messiah J-E-S-U-S. -S. We refer to him by his Hebrew name, Yahushua. And he's the one who should be esteemed by what took place and to give honor to the Most High Yah for what was done on the stake during that time. We know that this is a lot of information and we want to remind you that the cross that people adorn their houses with, wear as jewelry, use as a representation of their belief or faith, etc., is no more than a show of worship to the pagan deity T-A-M-M-U-Z. The cross gained acceptance along with many other pagan items 
as heathen influence gained dominance in the quote unquote church. This was partly to appease the growing heathen members along with the desire to move away from anything Hebrew. The cross has been used both as a religious symbol and as an ornament from the dawn of man's civilization. Various objects dating from periods long anterior to the Christian era have been found, marked with crosses of different designs in almost every part of the old world, according to Encyclopedia Britannica. Food for thought. Early Christian theologian and author from Carthage in the Roman province of Africa, Tertullian, writes of the devil's diabolical mimicry in creating the mysteries of M-I-T-H-R-A-S. The devil, whose business is to pervert the truth, mimics the exact circumstances of the divine sacraments. He baptizes his believers and promises forgiveness of sins from the sacred fount and thereby initiates them into the religion of M-I-T-H-R-A-S. Thus, he celebrates the oblation of bread and brings in the symbol of the resurrection. Let us therefore acknowledge the craftiness of the devil who copies certain things of those that be divine. Basically, he, Satan, tricks people into believing that they are worshiping the Father and honoring him through these customs and practices, but really, they are worshiping the things that belong to Satan. If we are to honor or esteem anything, let it be what Yahuwah tells us to honor or esteem according to his word. We all should remember that we are to live lives that please and honor the Father. We must separate from the things of this world and draw closely to Yah. Let us no longer be deceived, but have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts always ready to receive of all that Yahuwah wants to give us. Thanks for watching. We do hope this video has been helpful to you. We ask that you please like this video, share it, and subscribe to our channel, as this helps us to reach more people for Yah. May Yah Baruch you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May Yah turn his face towards you and give you peace. We love you and are praying for you. Until next time, family. Shalom. Shalom.